This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Kicking off the show today is Oklahoma State University Extension Fire Ecology Specialist John Weir to discuss considering different seasons for burning. He recently lectured about this at K-State's Kling Anderson Lecture. K-State Agriculture Policy Specialist Jenny Ift continues the show with reminders about pasture, rangeland, and forage insurance. We are also joined by Kansas FFA's Sage Taves and Cecilia Newby to talk about their experience at National FFA convention. Completing today's show is K-State Research and Extension Horticulture Agent for Wyandotte County, Lynn Lowry, as she discusses invasive plants and the problems they can cause. That and more is coming up ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Thursday show having a conversation with the person who's K-State's Clink L. Anderson lecturer, and that is John Weir, Oklahoma State University Extension Specialist in Fire Ecology. John, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you for having me. And John, before we hop to kind of what you'll be talking about at your lecture, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I like I said, I grew up in Oklahoma, uh, southwest Oklahoma. Went to school at Cameron down at Lawton, Oklahoma, and then went to school at Texas Tech. I've been at Oklahoma State University for 33 years. I ran the uh, OSU research range for 16 years of that. Uh, And then we formed the Natural Resource Ecology Management Department, and I was asked to come on campus then, and I've been there for the last 17 years. In reading about you, John, a lot of times I saw the words fire boss beside your name. I have. I've done a lot of prescribed burns. I've done actually over... 1,450 burns in the last 35 years, and I've been fire boss on most of them within that. So I've had a lot of experience with prescribed fire, and again, that's one of the biggest things I like to work about, work with and do is, especially the extension parts of it, is, tr- is training, working with landowners, agency groups, and stuff, and, and students, and teaching them how to, how to burn and, uh, you know, being able to apply fire to the land. With sharing that knowledge, you are the Kling L. Anderson Lecturer, and your lecture is titled Burning Outside the Box. And what do you mean by that? What I kind of mean by that is thinking about burning at different seasons of the year. Yeah, part of it is a lot of times we get rooted into thinking that we can only burn at one season of the year. And if you've done any amount of burning at all, you'll realize it, there's very few days to burn if you limit yourself to a certain season. And if you talk to most people that burn a lot and ask them the question, you know, did you get all your burning done this year? You did it. And most people will say, no, we didn't get it done. And it's why? Well, it's because, you know, we're limiting ourselves to a month or two in the spring when we can burn. So we ought to think about what about expanding that season out so that we can get more fire on the ground? Again, because due to varying weather conditions and burn bans and all kinds of things that always keeps getting thrown up in our face about you know, why we shouldn't burn or why we can't burn or, or makes it difficult. But if we could open that up to year round, you know, what, what would that do? What would that benefit? And, you know, how could we use that? And again, we need to get more fire on the ground. And so how can we do that? And so with that, all of your experience, how have you really seen burning evolve over the years? You know, I have definitely seen it over the over time. I think probably one of the, the best things that I have seen and been able to document is that you know, this is information from the great southern Great Plains especially, but Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska. We're seeing that almost 20% of the burns that are being reported on data that I, that I get from people that burn, landowners and stuff, they're, they're doing about 20% of their burns have now merged into becoming growing season burns. So they're not burning during that traditional late winter, early spring type burn season. So they're, they're spreading that out and, and for a lot of different reasons. And how have you seen rangeland kind of change depending on burning during emergence or growing? You know, a lot of it, you don't see a lot of dif- really big differences. You can see some subtle differences within that on, you know, plant response and doing that. Because again, if you think about it, all of our native plant communities are adapted to fire. Because if you think back historically and walk out on your property, you know, you look down, that piece of ground that you're standing on has burned every day of the year through time immortal. You know, you think about that. It's, it's burned every day. You know, again, Native Americans were the, were the fire setters and the main people doing that. They were, they were managing the land, you know, and, and, they, and they, they were doing it 
for the purpose of, of their survival and their livelihood. And again, the same reason we manage land today, you know, if you think about it, historically man managed their land, again, to provide them food, clothing, shelter, just like, just like we do today. So man has historically always modified the land they live on to make it easier. Man today modifies their land to make it profitable, make it livable, to make money, to do that. And in the future, we're not going to see any change. People will always do that. People have, will, and are continuing to manage their land. You think back historically, what did they have to manage their land with? And it was fire. That's all they had. You know, they had no no skid steers. They had no chemicals. You know, they had no brush hogs or anything like that. They had fire, and that's what they used. And they understood it, and they knew how to use it. And they used it for a lot of different reasons, and they used it specifically for that kind of thing. So is this more of there's not a correct, perfect time to burn, but there are multiple seasons, so you don't have to burn when you've always burned. That's, that's right. You know, again, it's, it's always and it will always be about goals and objectives. You know, what is your objective as, as a landowner? What is your goal? What are you trying to do and what do you want to see on your land? And so that, that, that's going to define what you want to do and how you want to do it. And so, you know, it's not I'm not saying that that should be the only time that you should burn. I think we should just open it up so that we can see different benefits and different things, because, again, we can burn. We can we've shown that we can burn at different seasons to benefit certain different things. Again, if it's livestock production, that's our main goal. Is it wildlife that is our main goal within wildlife? Is it certain bird species or is it pollinators or is it? We're just trying to kill kill cedar trees or reduce woody encroachment. You know what? You know what is our goals and what is our objectives? And there's there's something that we can do at any different season of the year to to help that and to and to get that. And also one of the things that I like to promote or used to promote growing season burns is the ease of burning. So you know a lot of times when we're burning in the spring, you know it, we're we're in dormant season. Everything everything's dormant. All the fuel's dormant. Also, if you look at it, you know, you know Kansas is we're, you're not much different than Oklahoma on that. You know March in Oklahoma, March is the windiest month of the year. So again, we're fighting with a lot of wind. It's also one of the driest months of the year, and we're also coming out of the driest period in Oklahoma. December, January, and February are the three driest months of the year. We have the least amount of precipitation during those three months. Also, if you look at in the winter months and follow any follow any weather, we got all these dry cold fronts that come through, changing wind directions about every two to five days, depending on what kind of pattern we're set up in. Humidities that get down into the single digits, and again, already dry fuels. And so, when we do go out to burn, a lot of times we're we're, we're battling against that, trying to make sure that that fire stays put, and we're trying to pick good weather conditions. If we think about other seasons of the year, especially in the growing season. You know, think about summer. Uh, July, August, September, we got that, you're kind of those summer doldrums and, you know, it's a rubber stamp weather forecast. You know, it's hot, it's more humid typically. So that, that gives us some, some benefit of that, but everything's green and growing. But again, you do have that rubber stamp of pretty consistent weather patterns and, and things that's going on. So there's, there's a definitely opportunity to get stuff done. And again, with that green, green vegetation and stuff, that fire reduces uses a lot of energy up boiling all the water out of that plant because that's what it's having to do. It's got to boil that water out of the plant to get it to burn. So, to be able to burn in the growing season, you have to have old growth from the previous year. That that residues what ignites and starts the fire. The fire continues to carry on through that, and then how much burns within that depends on the leaf moisture, how wet and damp everything is, how growing it is, but also that fire spends a lot of energy boiling water out of that and so it reduces its intensity so you don't see very big flames you see a really slow moving fire a lot of times people see it and they think well this fire is not doing anything it's just barely burning you know we're used to seeing the big flames fast moving with the dry dormant vegetation and so it changes the whole dynamic of it but also it it changes a lot of within the safety aspect of it so it makes it a lot safer to burn other than it's just hot outside. You know, a lot of times, you, like I said, those summer doldrums, it may be, it's 100 degrees out there. So that's the worst part is just putting up with the, the heat of the, the day and the fire, not anything that, you know, we're not as worried about stuff getting away and, and where's it going to go. It's not going to go anywhere real fast. 
So for producers who are thinking about when they're going to burn and what land they're going to be burning, what are a few key considerations you'd like them to keep in mind? You know, keep in mind that, that fire is important. It's an important part of management. It's an important part of the ecosystem. I think it's just if, if you rank sunlight, rainfall as the two most important things needed for plant growth, fire is number three. You have to have fire. That's what makes our, our grasslands our grasslands is that disturbance through fire to keep woody plants off of it. So we've got to be burning. And the key to fire, too, is frequency, is how often you're going to burn. It's not a one-time deal. You know, you can't just think, I'm going to burn one time and cure everything because it's not. You know, fire's not the one-time deal. You know, and, you know, you got to think back. A lot of those places that you haven't burned, it didn't get that way overnight. You know, and so one fire is not going to change it overnight either. So it's going to take time and, and fire frequency is the key to that. If people would like to find more information about kind of what you're talking about, where could they do that? Uh, go to do a search for okstate.edu extension. Uh, get in there and you can go into our fact sheets. We've got a lot of fact sheets and publications about prescribed fire, fire effects, fire ecology within that. Also, uh, we've got a great social media program through uh, in our natural resource ecology and management department through that on Facebook. So we put a lot of information in there about fire and everything else, natural resource related and ag related on that. John, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and share with us some information around burning pasture. Thank you. That was Oklahoma State University Extension Specialist in Fire Ecology, John Weir. I will link the resources that he mentioned in today's show notes on actoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our show discussing pasture, rangeland, and forage. And to talk about this, we're joined by K-State Flinchbaugh Agricultural Policy Chair, Jenny Ift. Jenny, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And Jenny, talking about pasture, rangeland, and forage, what is it? It's a type of insurance. It's a part of the federal crop insurance program. We refer to it as a rainfall index insurance because if a producer buys this insurance, they get paid when it doesn't rain as much as usual in their area. And what has 2022 looked like versus 2023? Well, it's it's taken, you know, a decade to get enrollment up. But in, in 2022, we had 3 million acres across Kansas. Now, this is of grazing land, pasture or hay can also be in it. But we went from 3 million in 2022 to 5 million acres in 2023. And that that was a very large increase. And I think a lot of it had to do with people's experience during the 2022 drought. I mean, part of that's the experience of drought can induce people to go buy insurance. But I think also a lot of people saw maybe their neighbors got indemnities or payouts that helped them get through some of those tough times. And is payouts really the big benefit from PRF? Yeah. So a producer is going to pick when during the year they get the insurance. So you have to pick among several two-month intervals within the year. And if it rains less than usual in your area, then you get paid. So it's not based on what happens on your farm. That's an important thing to know. It's based what's happened on your grid. A grid is smaller than the county, but, you know, you know a lot of cases here in Kansas where, you know, one field gets rain, one doesn't. So that's a risk a producer needs to be aware of. As we record, thinking about the deadline, however, as we look back, what has performance been like this year? Well, I did look at the 2023 performance to date. Now, this isn't comprehensive. It looks like payments have only gone through August. But if we look at the the halfway point, producers put in $25 million of their own money. That's the producer premium. The federal government pays a part of the other share. Um, And to date, on those 5 million acres, $35 million have been paid out. So for the state as a whole, Payouts have been larger than producer premiums. Now, a lot of areas are still experiencing drought or experienced drought earlier in the year. So that that number is not terribly surprising. Jenny, as we make that comparison, now specifically looking at 2022 and what were payouts like? Um, well, in 2022, producers put in over $14 million in premiums as the producer paid premium and payouts were over $46 million. So, you know, large payouts throughout the strait, really, you know, reflecting that we had most of the state in extreme or exceptional drought at one point in 2022. And so, Jenny, why are we taking the time to talk about this right now? 
Well, cattle prices are high, which is a good thing, yeah, especially for producers that want to build their herd or need to rebuild hay inventories. It can help manage that risk. If you know you're going to make some investments, what if it doesn't rain? What if your pasture is slower to grow back than usual? Or what if hay production is lower? It can help with that risk. And Jenny, as we round out today's conversation, are there really any counties in Kansas that you saw substantial payouts from? Several counties in, in central Kansas and a few in, in southeast Kansas. I think we're going to see those payments in southeast Kansas go up where you've really had drought go on there. But I looked at um, one where there was high payouts, and this is relative to premiums paid. Osborne County, there is over 68,000 acres enrolled in pasture rangeland and forage insurance, and they had very low rainfall from February to April. So the February to March index was 0.3. So that's 30% the rainfall is normal. From March to April, it was 29.6. So, you know, again, about 30% normal. So for producers that use those intervals, they would have received payouts. And for the county as whole, they've already um, received more than double in indemnities that has been paid in premiums. Now that's you know, might vary from producer to producer. Also looked at Coffee County in southeast Kansas, and they've received, again, more than double in indemnities and producers have put in. And they've had, you know, from March to April, rainfall was 47 percent. Um, April to May was 50 percent. May to June, it was 42 percent of normal. July to August, it got back up to 74 percent of normal, which still would have triggered for a lot of producers, especially those with higher coverage levels. So if producers are wanting to take the time to look at this insurance, what are a few key considerations they need to make? Like any crop insurance product, find a good agent that you trust. There's a lot of agents out there that have different tools that can really help producers go through the details, especially if it's a first time. You're going to have to sit down and do that. So a big difference, sort of, you could think of it as an advantage and a disadvantage. It's based on what happens in your area. So it's not personalized. So you're not always going to have payouts match what happens on your farm or on your ranch. There's that two-month window. You get a lot of rain at the end you might not get a payout. So producers need to understand those risks. One advantage of that is rainfall gets measured, the producer gets a payment. There's no loss adjustment. It's just automatic payment. And so is there a deadline upcoming for people who are interested in PRF? For the 2024 calendar year, it's December 1st. Recommend, Especially if it's your first time, I recommend getting in a couple weeks in advance. That was K-State Flinchbaugh Agriculture Policy Chair Jenny Ift. Before cutting to a break, we're joined with Kansas FFA reporter from Canton Galva, Sage Taves, and Kansas FFA Secretary from Labette County, Cecilia Newby, to discuss how the 96th National FFA Convention and Expo went. Kicking off the conversation with you, Sage, and how was this convention? Convention was super exciting in Kansas. We got to watch members of Kansas FFA cross the national stage several times to be honored for their achievements at the state and national level. I think that I speak for Cecilia and myself when I say it's always exciting when you get to hear the name Kansas called in Lucas Oil. So a great time, another worthwhile trip to Indianapolis. Absolutely. It was a great time uh, just getting to be with other members and then also serve the community that hosts us every year. Uh, We had the opportunity. I know some teammates and I got to travel to Broad Ripple. Uh, We got to give back to that community. We got to remulch a lot of their flower beds. We got to plant new flowers just to give the back and say thank you for everything that they've done for us as hosting our national convention. And who were this year's keynote speakers and what message did you receive from them? Juan Bendanda. He uh, definitely brought the energy in our opening session. He was able to challenge us to maybe step outside our comfort zone a little bit more and be who we are. And I know a lot of members uh, took that to heart. And he was just brought, like I said, brought that energy, brought that excitement to that first general session. And then joining us a little on later in the week was Corey Flournoy. Corey is a past national FFA president. And he went to high school in Chicago and had no agricultural background, but identified a passion for the FFA and the agriculture industry at his first national convention in Kansas City and served national FFA at a high level as a national president and is honored as the first African-American national president FFA's had. Since then, he's took his role and involved it in the FFA and serves on the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Board for National FFA and really just pioneers ideas on how we can grow our membership and ensure we're creating an FFA for all. Sounds like an exciting time at convention then and kind of what was that atmosphere like? 
the one word I love to use is electric. There's nothing quite like National FFA Convention, and I had the opportunity to share it with my teammates the first time we all got to go to that together. And so getting to share that electric energy and then once again watching the success of Kansas FFA truly did make that a worthwhile experience. I think a true testament to the electricity that FFA brings to Indianapolis could come from our teammate Kai, who was a first-time convention attendee this year. And Kai was at first just overwhelmed with the amount of Blue Jackets. Convention brings 71,000 individuals into Indianapolis with over 40,000 of those young people in the blue FFA jacket. Specifically looking at Kansas now, what were some achievements from Kansas FFA members? Like I mentioned a little on earlier, Kansas had their name called in Lucas Oil several times, which is exciting for state officers to be able to cheer and support our members. Kansas was extremely honored to present the National Creed Speaking Spanish Invitational National Champ was a member from Uniontown FFA, and the CDEs, or career development events, which are really just events that are allowing members to take hands-on agricultural practices into the petition form. We had eight in the gold division, six teams in the silver division, and two in the bronze. We also had a national champion in his proficiency award area, Noah Wiley from the Lebec County FFA chapter in grain production. Uh, So we were excited to see that and his success that he's had uh, with his supervised agricultural experience. Also in the LDEs or leadership development events, we saw some success from our members right here in Kansas. Tucker Leck, a member of the Neodice FFA chapter, was a finalist in the prepared public speaking where he was fourth overall. And Noah Goss, a member of the Ellsworth FFA chapter, was a semifinalist in the extemporaneous public speaking LDE. And in addition to that, our Mission Valley Parliamentary Procedure team was also advanced to the semifinals. So that was another great experience that we had. Exciting times for Kansas then at National Convention. And as we wrap up today's conversation, ladies, what was your favorite thing from convention? I think my favorite thing is undoubtedly something I've attested to a few times throughout today, and that was being able to support the young people of Kansas. We've experienced a 30% growth in the past 10 years in Kansas FFA. So to say we're growing would be undeniable, but we're not just growing. We're getting better um, and beginning to play at a higher level at the national level. I enjoy getting to see the excitement from a lot of our members. Like Sage said earlier, we have members that are traveling to Indianapolis for the first time. So getting to see their reaction, to see that it's a lot bigger than what's just in their hometown or in their state, that this is something that's going on nationally, and they're very excited about the future of FFA. And if people would like to find out more information about Kansas FFA, how can they do that? Well, you can always go to KansasFFA.org for more information related to what's happening right here in our state. National FFA obviously streams any information related to FFA at the national level, but both of those um, individuals are active on social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram and are always streaming information out that way as well. That was Kansas FFA reporter from Canton Galva FFA, Sage Taves, and Kansas FFA secretary from Labette County FFA, Cecilia Newby. I will link the resources that they mentioned in today's show notes on actday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. The November K-State Garden Hour, Plants Gone Wild, Controlling Invasive Species, helps gardeners be more aware of what invasive plants are and how they can impact the home landscape. K-State Research and Extension Horticulture Agent for Wyandotte County, Lynn Lowry, says an invasive species is any plant that causes economic, environmental, or human health concerns. They displace our native plant species. And therefore, that alters animal habitat, food sources are lost. Sometimes these plants will fuel fires like cheatgrass, which is common out in western Kansas, or eastern red cedars that are throughout our plains states. Also, they can affect the quality of our wetlands and result in flooding. Mainly, if you think about waterways, anything that would plug up waterways, sometimes people will consider cattails or lilies, or sometimes some of our perennials will escape into wet areas. The other thing, and really important for any state that's a big crop producer, is these plants interfere with crop production, meaning that the farmers are docked for having weeds in their crops that they're harvesting. Also, for homeowners, a lot of times invasive species will decrease property values. 
invasive plants do not stay within their boundaries. They'll be planted one place and then escape or move to other areas. How does that happen? Well, these are very aggressive plants with invasive characteristics. They reproduce rapidly. They have abundant seed production. That seed remains viable for a long time. It can stay dormant until conditions are favorable and then start to grow. They also will have a high seed germination rate. So when animals or birds eat the seed and poop it out, you have a high germination rate. A lot of those plants will germinate and then become a problem. They also have rapid growth and will spread either by rhizomes as well as their root system. They usually establish over large areas and then they persist and they displace our existing native plants. They're just so aggressive that they take over. A lot of these plants have very aggressive roots or rhizomes. They have large food reserves. So as the plant makes photosynthesis for food, it stores that food in the root system. And they have a high photosynthetic rate. Matter of fact, they can make a lot more food than your typical native plant. And this gives them a competitive advantage. There are over 1,100 plant species that have been reported as being invasive. And that varies from area to area, soil type to soil type, climate to climate. So it just depends on where you live, which plants are considered invasive. Some invasive species were actually planted intentionally, mainly for erosion control. Some plants were brought in for livestock grazing. They had a high photosynthetic rate, lots of carbohydrates in them, and therefore they were very conducive for livestock to graze on. But then they took over. Wildlife habitats. Sometimes we bring in plants to create habitat for pheasants or quail. And then again, ornamental purposes. We try to improve our cultivars year after year for different characteristics, and sometimes those plants become invasive. One thing I want to say, and I can't say this with any more importance, but you've got to read and follow label directions. Is the weed that you're trying to control on the label? Is the site to be sprayed on the label? In other words, is it labeled for pasture and rangeland? Is it labeled for roadsides? Is it labeled for non cropland? And then, most importantly, what is the rate? When do I put it out? What timing? And then, does the product have any kind of restrictions? And chemicals should be your last strategy. You should try to remove flowers and seeds, dig it out, or whatever you can do to keep it managed before it gets to the point where you have to use chemicals. That's K-State Research and Extension Horticulture Agent for Wyandotte County, Lynn Lowry. The November Garden Hour, Plants Gone Wild, Controlling Invasive Species, is available online at hnr.k-state.edu or Google K-State Garden Hour. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.